generosity, outrageous generosity, and I love, uh, I love that idea. I even love, I'm big on words, and so I really like that idea of outrageous generosity, piece it together, and so um, I don't know if you do this or not, but I'm going to read the dictionary definitions of outrageous and generosity. So outrageous is, uh, I love this, passing reasonable bounds. So when you do something outrageous, you, you're passing reason, you're going beyond reason, you're doing something shocking, extravagant, remarkable. Uh, those are fun Those are fun adjectives, right? Mm -hmm. To do something remarkable, to do something shocking, to do something uh, even farther than you could think, than you could even maybe even dream. Uh, and then generosity is this idea of a readiness to give, uh, being liberal in giving or sharing. And then a, another a definition is living open-handed. I really like that, that idea of living open-handed. And so, um, man, th this morning, what would that look like? What does that look like for, for me, Morgan? What does that look like for you guys? To, to live out this life that, that's beyond what you can even maybe even and think or, or imagine, uh, that, that it is living open-handed, um, and, and I, I think it's crazy, you know, we, we uh, a lot of times in our Christian world, in, in our church world, um, we're so quick to tell God, I, hey, I, I'll gladly give you, right, I, I trust you with eternity, but then we struggle to trust him with our paycheck week to week, yeah. right, and, and, and there's a there's a disparity there to say, God, I, I trust that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, and I'm going to walk streets of gold, but right now, I need this week to week paycheck. Uh, and, and what God actually calls us to do is, is to live uh, this outrageous, generous life. Uh, and, and to be honest, it's not because it's not a, a Pastor Bob who wants more of your money, he wants a better car. It's not <laughs> Pastor Andrew who wants a raise. Um, it, the reason we talk about outrageous generosity, it's not, it's, to be honest, it's not even because the church probably even desperately needs your money. It's because it's what Jesus did. And our highest calling, our first calling, is to live like Christ, right? It is to live as Jesus lived here and in this place, here and now. And, and, and so when you think about Jesus, he is by far the most outrageously generous person to ever walk the face of the earth. And not, not necessarily with dollars and, and, and cents, but when you talk about grace, you talk about mercy, you talk about a readiness to give up everything he had, right? He, so what do we believe? We believe Jesus was up in heaven on the throne and, and initiated with the readiness, with the willingness to come down to earth to say, I'll give every last breath, I'll give every last drop of blood, I'll give everything that I have for, uh, for people. And you know, here's what's crazy to me, here's, here's something I think about from time to time, is that, <clears throat> right, because as Christians, we, we're recipients of this amazing, uh, outrageous generosity. But Jesus even died for the millions upon millions of people who walk the face of the earth who never accepted his grace. Grace that never goes received. He, he still initiated to, to, to live open-handed, to give everything he had, being all-knowing, all-powerful, knowing full well that the majority of people who would walk the earth would never fully accept his grace. He still said, yeah, I'll, I'll give my blood, I'll give, I'll give my life even for them. And so... <clears throat> The reason it's important to talk about outrageous generosity is because it's, it's Christ-like. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to be like Christ. We're called to live a life like Christ would live. And, and so my hope is that more than, uh, for our lives, is really more than to be outrageously generous with, with our money, is that it would be a whole lifestyle thing. That all of my time I make fully disposable to the kingdom of God. All my energy, all of my emotions, all, all of uh, everything I have, my house, my family, uh, my, my time, everything I have, this is what we're called to. And, and, and so I, I like, we, I love when we use powerful words, but then I also, I want to make sure we know what we're talking about. Over the top, unreasonable. Like God might want you to, to give more, to, to, to answer problems that you haven't even thought of, that are bigger than you even imagine you could be part of the solution to. And, and so what does it look like to live this amazing, outrageous, generous life? Does, do you, any of you guys, you have an outrageous friend, like that person who always, they're, they're just a little bit louder than everybody else, or they're, they're, yeah, they're just a little farther over the top than everybody else, and... and so I want you to start to think, what does that look like? I don't, you don't have to be that person necessarily, but in your own unique way, how is God going to call all of us to, to live this open-handed, this God, you have access to everything I have type of life. And so I want to read uh, uh, one of the stories in the Gospels in Matthew 14, if 
you have your Bibles in Matthew 14. And I think it's one of the best stories. I think you see a lot of different uh, angles of generosity and outrageous generosity. And so I'm going to start in verse 13. And it's a story you probably know, but it's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And it says this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As the evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, do they, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Verse 17. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men besides women and children. Let's pray one last time. God... We just invite you in this place, Holy Spirit, we invite you here, challenge our, our, our thinking and our view. God, help us to live just an open-handed and outrageously generous life. Help us to be even more outrageously generous with our time, our emotions, our energy, our money. God, we, we give you full access to everything we have because that's how you approach us, with everything you have. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what I want to do this morning is we're going to kind of just walk verse by verse through this a little bit. And what are some of the key factors to living an outrageously generous life? And the first thing, I love verse 13 because it kind of sets the stage. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, which begs the question, well, what had just happened? Uh, Jesus had just lost his very best friend. He had just lost John the Baptist. He, he, this is probably, uh, up until this point, this is probably the hardest day that Jesus had on earth. His cousin, who, who he grew up with, his cousin who baptized him, uh, his, his, one of his closest friends, is, is not only killed, but beheaded. It's gruesome. Uh, he's made a spectacle. They, they kill John the Baptist, they chop off his head, and they actually parade it around on a platter. Like, it's intense. Uh, and, and so Jesus, he, this is, this is the, like, I think a lot of times we hear this story and we're like, oh, what a happy-go-lucky day. There's fish and bread and it's Thanksgiving. This is a hard day. And I think that, I think the misconception is that in Christianity we often think that uh, outrageous generosity, yeah, yeah, it's that moment when I, I win the lottery and although I shouldn't have played the lottery, maybe I played the lottery and, and I get this massive check and then I give a little bit away because I'm feeling good. Uh, most of Christianity, most of living a generous life is living a generous life when it's hard. We're, we're often called to be generous in hard seasons. We, 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 we're often called to live this way when you're running on empty. And so maybe you walk in this place and you're like, why are they talking about generosity again? Like, don't they know? Like, you know, my, my, our home life is falling apart. Like, my, my job's not going the way I planned. You know, my kids are being crazy. Like, I don't need to talk about money. What I need to talk about is how God's grace and love is going to wash over. And, and, and what, what's amazing about the Christian life is that so often when God's going to do something, it, it often happens in a hard season. I wish it were different. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish it was always gumdrops and lollipops. Uh, but it's not. That's not the reality. That's not uh, what we're asking. We're not asking, hey, when life is at its best, would you then give a little? It, it's saying in every season, when, when life is great, when, when, when I'm flying high, and, and when I'm at my very worst, even then, I, I, will be gener I will give everything I have to the kingdom of God. Because I serve a Jesus who gave everything he had for every moment that he was alive and still does. That we serve a God who, who says, right, things like, my mercies are new every morning. All right? And, and so we cling to that. We cling to that open-handedness of God when, when life is hard for us. But, but will we live with an open-handedness, with an outrageous generosity when life is hard? And so here's Jesus. And, and he's just in that moment that I, need, I just need a moment. You ever just need a moment? I've got two kids. I need lots of moments. Um, my wife probably needs more. She's like, I need moments for my kids and my husband. I just need lots of moments. But right, so Jesus, he's there. And, and this is terrible news. His best friend's dead, killed, paraded around. Why? Because of a, a high school girl asked for that, essentially. I mean, just a terrible story. And he just, 
I just need a moment. Right? And my emotions are wearing thin. Life is hard. If I could just get on a boat and maybe just sail away, you ever want to just get on a boat? Wouldn't that be great if we just like, I'm just going to go to Lake Mendota and I'm just going to sail around a little bit and I'll come back when, when everything's fine. Uh, but I, what I love about Jesus is that time and time again is that he sees crowds and he's moved with compassion. And at the heart of, of living a, a, a generous life, an outrageously generous life is that you have to have eyes of compassion. You, you've got you've to get to this place where you say, God, in every high moment, in every low moment, would you rewire the way that I view the world so that I would see people with eyes of compassion? Man, this is... a. Uh, this is what has been, been kind of our, we've been here in Madison and, and a little bit, and man, you just drive around the city, and drive, we drive by that campus, and you just see those, those 40,000 students walking from class, and, and to be honest, it just breaks our hearts. Why? Because God's just given us a heart of compassion. Has God get, may, maybe that's your prayer this morning. God, would you give me eyes of compassion for my world again? Like your neighborhood. Like, do, do you, is it the reality that, that if, if we don't reach that neighborhood, no one else will? That if you don't reach that workplace, that there's, not a, there's not an emergency Christian squad coming in, you know, CIA going to kick down the door, hand them a Bible, baptize them, and no, like, it, it's us. It's us in this room. This is it. Here's the solution for Madison. And it starts with living a generous life, but, but how do you have a generous life? It's when you see people and, and you have eyes of compassion. And people, and the sight of people, and unsafe people, and hurting people moves you. Because when, pe when you carry people in your heart, it, it changes the way you carry the dollars in your pocket. And so Jesus, I love it, it, it says, uh, he, he's at the solitary place, but he sees a large crowd, and he has compassion. And I, here's my prayer, more than anything else. If you don't get anything else, I pray that you would walk out of these doors with the eyes of compassion. That it would cause you to work at your coworkers different. It would cause you to work at your neighborhood different. It would cause you to look at your family different. Uh, man, if you can get eyes of compassion like Jesus did, it'll change the whole perspective of how you live your life. It'll change everything. So your perspective matters. If you're going to live a generous life, you've got to really think, man, what's my perspective? It, it, again, it's not just about dollars and cents. It's not about a certain percentage of what you give. It's saying, is it people that you carry? Do you carry the heart behind why you give? Do you carry the heart behind why you're doing what you do? People are always at the forefront of what Jesus does. And then verse 15, it says, As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. And what's funny about the Bible is that sometimes the Bible will just kind of make a very quick generalization for what happens. Uh, so Jesus, right, he gets off this boat, but then he works an eight, nine hour day touching nasty infected bodies. Like we're talking pre-hospital days, like open sores, nasty wounds, any other germaphobes in here? Like that's my nightmare. Like my kids get now and I'm like, go see your mother, she'll take care of it. Like, so like he gets off the boat, emotionally drained, pretty tired, pretty in need of just some alone time, but, but there's people here, there's work to be done. I, I guess I'll keep showing up, even though I don't really feel like it. And just hour after hour, person after person, yeah, what can I do for you? How, how can, you need healing? I mean, he just, he just, he just heals, he heals people. He heals 5,000 people for a day. Just, uh, what, a general, what a great generalization, right? Like, but Andrew, what did you do today? Well, I healed people all day. Oh, okay. You know, like, it, it just very, in, in a very passive way, Jesus just, man, a lot of living a generous lifestyle it, it is being generous when no one else is watching, when you don't get recognition. Uh, when maybe you, no one else will even notice, right? It's not just that moment where you get to hand that large cardboard check and, and you're, you shake and smile and it goes in the newspaper. Like, that's not outrageous generosity. That's not what we're calling you to. It, it's saying when no one else is watching, would you take your lunch break with that, per, that co-worker who needs somebody in their life so that you can talk with them about their life? Although, man, but you don't understand that's my time. I, that's my time to just... That's me time. You know, like that's my safe zone. Right? No, it's saying even then, well, would you give up that time? Would you give up that, that your time, your own personal guarded time to advance the kingdom of God? 
It's saying, would you give up that, that little bit uh, of, you know, that Starbucks drink, that, that little extra something you have because there, there's a need? Again, which is, well, why? How is that going to happen? It's only going to happen when you see people with compassion. It'll only happen when in your heart you carry people. You carry names and faces of people who matter. That, that's how it is. That's how you live a generous life. And, and so Jesus just, in a very non-highlighted way, just all day, touching people. What can I do? Looking people in the eyes. Taking time. Puts, it, puts a whole day on hold. A whole day he probably needs for himself to say, what can I do for you? I want to be here for you. How, how can I impact your life? How can I touch your life? So Jesus is generous with, with his time, his emotions. And most of life, to be honest, most of our Christian life, right, it goes unnoticed. But most of, uh, like in ministry, you, you, you learn this very quickly, is that most of life is not preaching on a stage. Most of life is one-on-one -on -one with people. Most of life is not very glamorous. It's, it's inserting yourself in the messy situations. It's inserting yourself in, in places where uh, maybe other people don't want to go. It's going to, to be honest, I, like... Going and doing Chi Alpha is not a super glamorous job. Uh, like for me, at this stage of my life, with two kids, it's not super convenient to, to move right next to Camp Randall. Uh, with college kids, they're going to want to drink and party all night. But, that, but, but what happens is when God puts something on your heart, when he gives you an eyes of compassion for a crowd, it will rearrange what your priorities are. It will rearrange uh, what you have capacity for. So Jesus is in the middle of just uh, all day long, just, just healing people, touching people, just the, the humdrum of life, just the routine. But he, he, what's amazing, right, he's inserted this outrageous generosity into average everyday living. He's gotten to a point now where just, it's just routine for him to take time with people. Man, I hope that's how I live. That's, right? That, I mean, this is why Jesus is the ultimate example. He just, this is just who he is, all day, every day. What can I do? How can I touch people? How can I change people? And I love this because uh, it says, as evening approaches, the disciples came to him and said, uh, this is a remote place. It's getting late. Hey, listen, the crowd's getting hungry. Some of you are like this right now. You're like, listen, we got to wrap it up. Like, we got some food at home. Uh, you know, you ever been in a service and your tummy starts to growl? And the Easter's kind of that way a little bit because you always, you always do a big lunch for Easter. You know, it's like, all right, you've made your three points. <laughs> I got a ham in the oven. You know, right? And so it's that time of day, and, 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 you know, Jesus is kind of doing his thing. It's been a long day, and touching people, healing people. And uh, the disciples say, hey, we got to get people out of here, right? It's lunch, it's dinner time. Uh, we got to go get some food. What's crazy to me is that um, they, and this is why I love the story, right? They, they're not even thinking, it's not even reasonable to them that they would feed these people. It's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't even cross their mind, right? It's so far removed from what they would even think about doing. They're like, hey, Jesus, a whole lot of people, let's send them home. Let's get them out of here, right? And, and sometimes that's what Jesus does, right? right? Is that what can happen in a moment is that you're like, oh, God, you have this whole city. Send somebody to Madison to reach all these people, God. And in that one moment, God could be like, hey, send somebody. It's you. Uh, let's go feed them. Right? Like, like hey, uh, God, we got to do something about this messed up. 54% of the people don't know Jesus. What's wrong with these people? They're definitely going to hell. You need to send more pastors here. We need more churches. And God said, hey, no, you know, I have just what I need right here, right now, for this season to do this outrageous, generous thing. And a lot of times in our world, we're so locked in because outrageous is saying beyond reason. So far beyond what you can imagine, what you even think you could accomplish. Like, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, even growing up, I, I sat in my good church chair and I said, God, uh, hey, I, I'm excited for what you're doing in my dad's life. And he just said, man, I'm going to blow the reason of your own life. Of what you, I'm actually going to use you to be part of the solution. And so we're not just called to point out problems. Do you know that in Christianity? So the disciples, I think sometimes the disciples are awesome at this. They point out a lot of problems. Don't be that church person. Uh, I mean, you know, like, they didn't ask me to say this, but don't be that guy, right? You know, like, I think a lot of times, like, it's like, hey, pastor, you know, we need, we need a greeter. <laughs> yeah, you would be a great greeter. You know, like, and be great at pointing out solutions. Let's be people who are great at not just seeing problems, but also seeing ourselves as being a part of that solution. If you only work at your, your workplace and you're like, God, 
these people need Jesus, but you don't ever view yourself as being the Jesus that they need to see. Maybe God wants to do something outrageous in your life. If you see people hurting or in need around you, and your thought is, man, I, I wish that somebody would give them some money or give them this or that, it's probably you. God's probably you wanting to, to stir your heart and to use you. And, and so be people who don't just point out problems, but be people who point out solutions. And I love the, you know, the, the quote is that it, it, if what God has called you to do doesn't scare you, it might not be a God-sized goal. Right? It, 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 if I'm only believing God for what I can accomplish on my own, then I probably am not fully believing in a big, big God. And, and so, again, we, we read in our theology, we, we, we paint a big God, but sometimes in our practical life, and our practical living, we don't always believe in a big, big God. I love verse 16. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. You give them. Man, this church, you guys have everything you need to make an impact on the city. Me and Morgan, we've got everything we need to make an impact on that campus. We've got it all. How? Well, God has sent us here. He's called us. We, we've got everything we need. And how? So how does this work? And so kind of setting the stage uh, now, I want to look at just a couple of quick things of like, well, how does this crazy miracle happen? And, and again, I've read this story a lot, but, but when I, I really started to break this down, it, it kind of blew my mind a little bit. And so uh, the, the first thing is that uh, verse 17, he, he says, you give them something to eat. And the disciples say, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. And so the first thing I would tell you, if you want to do something outrageous, uh, you gotta, you got to do the spiritual, but you also got to do the practical. you got to know your resources, right? And so this is, this is just a numbers game. Well, all right, all right, Jesus, you want to feed all these people? Here's all we got. I only got, I got, ten, I got a little snack pack lunch. That's it. You know, like, uh, this is all we have. I love it because Jesus always says, that's what we got. That's what we'll work with. That's what you got. All right, that's what we're going to do a miracle with. Right. You're here this morning and say, God, I don't have much. But the, the reality is, if you'll give that little that you have, and you'll put it in God's hand, He can do much. And, and, and so, it, you know, it, the first is you've you got to know your resources. Listen, it's okay. Like, if you, to be honest, if you want to live a generous life, you're probably going to need to budget your money. Like, that's, like, God's not afraid of organization. I think sometimes in church we're, we're afraid of the practical stuff. We always want to over-spiritualize things. Like, to be honest, if, if, if I'm going to give the way that God's called me to give, I need to know where I'm spending my money. I need to know what I have as a resource. I, if I'm going to give it away, i got to know what I have, right? And so, hey, do you have a car? Do you have a house? Do, do you have money? You know, do, do you have time? Do you, what, what days of the week do you have open that you could spend with people? How, you know, how, where is all my money going? If you don't have those things, I would encourage you to get, do those things. Those are very spiritual things. This is Jesus doing some accounting, right? Okay, hey, if we're going to, well, let's break this down, all right? We've got 5,000, and it's actually closer to 10,000, 15,000, just 5,000 men and then their families and kids. So probably 10, 15,000 people. How are we going to break this down? Well, we just got to start with step one. What do you have? What do you have as a resource? What do you have in your hand? I mean, I, I, one summer, I was interning at a church, and uh, I got somebody just donated me a car to drive around all summer. And I was like, loving it. I was like, yes, I got a car. Like, I can drive around. It was a trailblazer. It was an old trailblazer, but it was a trailblazer. It was great. And then uh, a, a guy in our church who played the bass for us said, hey, I, I need a ride. And I was like, yeah, you do. You live like 20 miles away from me. I hope you find a ride. Uh, and then God was like, hey, wait a second. Did I just give you a resource? Did I just put something in your hand? Uh, and so I'll be honest. I spent that whole summer driving this guy rich back and forth every church service. Every church service. Every church service. All that gas money. Trailblazers do not get good mass gas money. They are not a hybrid. You know, like just every week, every week, every week. And what happened over that week was a friendship. <laughs> And that friendship turned it into to a man. He was like he was like an uncle to me, which led to me leading him to the Lord a year before he passed away. Why? Because I had a resource in my hand and I made it fully open to God. Whatever you is saying, whatever I have, if I can use it for the kingdom of God, you can have it all. And, and, and man, I just remember like that night when God's like, "No, you you give him a rock." 
I just remember just like the conviction of saying, God, how, could, how did I not even think of this before? You know, like, how, like you know, it was, it was so, I didn't, it was something I never even fathomed. You know, I, what was amazing about my household, um, man, I had, I, both my parents and my in-laws, I'm so blessed, are, are pastors, and my parents raised my friends. I grew up in a very inner city area. I grew up, uh, my best friend had no father figure in his life. He spent most of his nights at our home, eating, eating around our dinner table. Why? Because my parents weren't rich, but what they had was enough mac and cheese for one extra plate. And so they said, hey, come on over. Maybe God wants to, to stretch your imagination. Maybe, maybe he's saying, yeah, you actually can do something. You do have something to give. You do have something to offer. And so what do you have? What are your resources? Start to organize your life. Start to say, hey, maybe I can cut back on, maybe we don't need the full cable package. You know, maybe I just need, you know, X amount of channels. Maybe I don't, you know, start to simplify. Start to know where things are going. Start to get it organized. Why? This is a, that's what sets the groundwork for a miracle. When you start to organize your time and your life, you're, you're setting groundwork for God to do amazing things. And so Jesus has it and he says, just bring them to me. Which is the same thing he asked this morning. Everything you have, would you just bring it to me? Would you trust me? To be honest, um, here's what's amazing about this. Uh, it is that my resources are better off in God's hands. Uh, and, and right, we say that as a cliche. But, you know, think about this. So, like, for me, when, when my money's in my hands, uh, with my occupation, I have a ceiling on what I can earn, right? I'm only going to make X amount of dollars being a, a missionary living off of other people's support. It's not a lucrative business, people. Uh, right? but, but when I place it in God's hands, now we're talking about a God who literally told the guy one time, hey, go down, open up that fish's mouth, and I, I can make money, I can make it rain any time, any day, any place, right? And so when you actually have a higher ceiling for earning and for finances, when you put it in God's hands. I mean, unless you're like, you know, a millionaire in here, and, and you're hiding from the rest of us. Like, my, my ceiling potential uh, for earning and on the money side is actually higher when it's in God's hands. Because when it's just in my hands, I can only take it so far. And then, and then I'm stopped. And so Jesus, all he asks this morning is for what you have. But he does ask for everything you have. And I think sometimes in our Christian life, right, we, we kind of want to take, well, God, we had five loaves and, and two fish, but I... I need those three fish and the one. So we really just have one piece of bread. You know, right? Like sometimes those, I, I'll take kind of my cut and then I'll trust God with this little extra something. God, no, that's not. The, aren't you glad that's not the Jesus you serve? Yes. Aren't you glad that you have a God who said, uh, hey, I'm not just going to you know, give you the grace for what you need uh, in, in one moment, but hey, the God that's described in the gospel is so abundantly more. Right? He's even more than we can ask or think or imagine. He's, he's outrageous with his mercy. He's outrageous with his love. He's outrageous with, with his affection towards us. Why? Because he's everything I have all the time for you. In response, what's my best course of action? God, everything I have all the time for your kingdom and your glory. And so Jesus only asks for what you have, but he asks for everything you have. Holding nothing back. And you're like, man, but I feel under-resourced. I, I feel un unqualified. I feel like I don't have enough. I don't have access. That's exactly right. This is this story. I mean, they are extremely, extremely under-resourced here. <laughs> how much you have is not the point, but how much of it you will give. That righteous generosity, is not, it's not how much you have, but it's how much you will give. And then verse 18, he says, bring it here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. And then uh, the other versions in the other Gospels, he actually talks about the numbers. He says, have them get in groups of 50 and 100. Get in an organized pattern. Again, he's setting the groundwork for this miracle. He's setting this groundwork for this outrageous miracle. He's saying, all right, you guys, 50. Okay, you carry over. Carry the one, right? And here's another 50. Here's 100. All right, all we have is these five loaves and these two breads, so we know what we got. I'm starting to get a budget for my life. I know, okay, here's where I'm spending my money. Here's how much I have in savings. Here's how much time I have. Here's my open spots. Uh, here's where I'm serving on the church. Here's, you know, like I'm starting to, all right, I'm getting everything organized. And now, God, what do you want to do? I'm, I, now I give you everything. It's all organized. I got it all squared away. Now it's all in your hands. And, and I love this. And it says, um, he directed people to sit down. Then he give, uh, he taking the five loaves of bread and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gives thanks and broke the loaves. I would say this, is that after you get organized, 
once you know what resources you have, I would give a whole lot of thanks and I would pray a lot. <laughs> How awesome is this? Jesus, who, who has the, the Savior of the world, who, who's seen what's ahead and behind us, takes time and says, God, thank you. God, we may not have much, we, we don't have a whole lot going, but, but you see something bigger that's about to hap happen, and I just thank you. Right, man, right, do you live a, a life of gratitude? My dad would always say, do you have an attitude of gratitude? Right? Do you have an attitude of gratitude? I mean, that's something you can't fake, right? When's the last time you're like, yes, God, here's, a, here's my tithe. Like, let's go. You know, like, just an attitude that says, God, I, it's my great privilege. You know what will shock people is when you start to have gratitude as you're giving everything away. That would, that would probably shake up your world a little bit. When, when you really carry the heart and like, man, why, why would you sacrifice all day to help me move? Moving is the worst. I've done it a lot. Trust me. Moving is the worst, right? Why? Why would you do that? But, and you, start, you know why? You want to know why? Because I have a God, right, who, who gave everything he had for me, who's, not, who's taking days and, and years to just spend time with me. He sent his son to walk 30 plus years on this earth just for me, that I serve a God whose mercy is new every morning. I have a God who, who lavishes his grace on my life. Then they'll be like, that was more, that was a, I didn't want that full answer. You could have just told me I had the day off or something, right? But when you start to give, and it's, so, and it's so genuine in who you are, in the DNA of what God's done in your life, have an attitude of gratitude. So he gives thanks, he prays, and if you're going to do something outrageous, you Right, but it's a moment when it leaves your hands that you start praying really, really hard. You ever been in that moment? Like you wrote, you wrote that check that you, you're like, I hope they don't cash that till Tuesday. But you know, and then, God, give, give me money. You know, I need money. Um, and and uh, man, when you put everything in God's hands, and, and you start at, at the beginning, you'll start to pray like crazy. If you need a prayer life, start to walk out in, in big, big faith. And what you'll find is that you can never outgive God. Like people say that all the time, but very few people ever, ever try that out. You can't do it. It won't happen. Um, and I can tell you countless stories. I remember uh, as a senior in high school, my parents had planted a church out north of Boston. Uh, and they went about a good year without taking a paycheck. Because it's just God asked them to give the money back to the church to keep the church afloat. And every, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I would... I, as a high school, I was sitting in a prayer meeting one time. I had a pastor who I didn't even know. He, he walked up. He said, hey, I don't know why, but you should give this check to your parents. I gave it to my parents. It was every dollar and cent we needed to pay the bills. I mean, I come from one of five kids. We're all teenagers. We're eating a lot of food. You know, like, uh, just to see the miracles of God happen. To see missionaries who are overseas send checks back to my parents and say, we don't know why, but we were praying. God said, we need to send our support money back. And for that to be the money we needed to cover the bills. And man, I I, uh, I, I can brag on this right here. I mean, I, my dad, the, the stories that were told in my family, my dad was in a service once, and the missionary gave an off, 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 offering, you know, call, and, and he didn't have any money, so he took off his wedding ring and put it in the bag. My mom doesn't like that story as much. Uh, but what would it look like? And, and not just money, but to say, God, everything I have is fully disposable. It, I'll tell you what, uh, the, reason, the reason that I'm saved today is because of those moments. The reason that I follow the Lord today is because my parents lived out a very authentic, very outrageously generous life. Um, so for me, it's, it's what challenges me uh, as a dad and a parent. You know, the practical side says, man, I should put more in savings. I should spend more time doing these things. Uh, but when God says, hey, do this, I, I've got to follow that because it, then I'm trusting Him. And when I trust Him, with my most valuable resources, they're in the best place they can be. So Jesus breaks them, he prays for them. But here's what's cool about the story. Did you ever notice this? Where does this miracle happen? Yeah, but, so right, he doesn't just say amen and like buckets of fish and bread start just raining down. That's not like, right? We just think like, you open our eyes, oh, buckets of fish. No, here's how it happens. A lot of times God does miraculous things through incremental stages. And so it's in Jesus' hands. He gives it to the disciples' hands. And the disciples are like, okay, well, here we go. And I bet you they were really small pieces at first, right? Here's a little for you. Here's a little for you. Here's a little for you. At what point did they realize, like, holy, what's going on here? Like, this just got, this got outrageous. 
Like this got bigger than we could imagine. Like this is, what is, I, what is going on? You're like, at what point? And, and this is how it happens in your life. It is you start to say, God, all I have is this little bit. And at first, you're probably a little stingier with it. Like, I'll give you this little bit, I guess. You know, God, I need that little bit back. You know, and, and, and as you start to hand it out, is that it starts coming back in faster than you could even imagine. The miracle happens in the hands of the disciples. This is what this is the, the exchange. It's saying, God, here's everything. And he says, Awesome, thank you. I'll bless this. Hey, here it is back. And then, you, and, then it, and then it leaves your hand again. Right? And so a lot of times in churches, God, thank you. Kind of bless this. We'll kind of both hold this check for a little bit. <laughs> all right? And then we want it back and we want it blessed. And God says, No, boom, it's all the way in God's hands. That you can have if you want it all, you can have it all. And God sends it back, and then the miracle starts to happen. And I love it, uh, because we also have, He exceeds expectations. God will exceed your expectations every time you step out of faith. Maybe not in a financial way. Uh, I'm not saying, hey, give God $10, and He's going to give you a million dollars. That's not the gospel. That's not what I'm saying. But He will exceed your expectations. <coughs> For my parents, it was that year of faith. My senior year of high school, it, it, they stepped out in faith financially, and it really it was the year that I gave my heart to the Lord. Without that year, I, I would not be here. What exceeded their expectations was that their son would come back to knowing Jesus. He will always exceed your expectations. It may not be monetary. It may not be the way you, you want it to be or the way you're trying to tell God it's going to be, but he will exceed your expectations. And, and I love this because we also serve a God who's not wasteful, right? The story's done. He just says, hey, let's get all those extra pieces. So we're not just talking about like being, you know, like fickle with our, our money and just throwing it away. We're, we don't serve a wasteful God. I mean, he, he says, let's get all the, like, everything that's left over, let's collect that. Let's see what, what, what happens here. You serve a God who, who's not wasteful. He's not going to be wasteful with what you give him. And so they collect it all back. And here's, here's another little side note on the story, right? Because who, who gave this lunch to Jesus? It was a, it was a small boy. But the small boy doesn't go home with the, the basketfuls of fish. I think sometimes in our theology, that's what we think happens. Right? We're like, God, I gave you my little lunch, and so now I want those extra 12 baskets full. That's not what happens. But he, you know who starts this miracle is that little boy. And you know what it says? It says that whole crowd ate and was satisfied. That that boy was satisfied. He walked away from that moment with Jesus fully satisfied. Knowing that his miracle could actually happen not even in his hands. Do you know that sometimes you'll give and, and you won't even necessarily be the recipient of the miracle. The miracle will happen in somebody else's hands, in somebody else's household, but you'll walk away fully satisfied. Why? Because you've got to be a part of the kingdom of God. And when we stop looking for just our own satisfaction, and we stop looking to take on our own extra resources and we say, God, I don't care where you do the miracle. I don't care who you do the miracle for. All I care is that your glory grows and that your kingdom of God grows. It will change the way that you get. Can you imagine that boy? Well, where, who got the leftovers? I don't know who got the leftovers, but I gave those fish and I gave those bread. I bet you he told that story while it's his 50s, 60s, 70s, up until the day he died. I got to be a, play a small part in an outrageous, lavish, generous act of God. That's the invitation this morning, right? That's the invitation every single day. That we would play our small little part for God to do something so outrageous, so over the top, so mind blowing, and we just do, get to do our own little part. Maybe we only just get a small little piece of the glory. Maybe we don't get any at all. That's awesome. That's what, that's what I'm excited to see. That's how I want to live my life. So let's do this. If you would, would you maybe close your eyes this morning? Let's process this. What does this look like? Man, maybe you're, you're in this place, and, and, and uh, I don't make light of if life is really hard, if, if you're going through something very difficult. Uh, if you're in this place uh, this morning, and you're with eyes closed and, and head bowed, and, and you've had a rough week, you've had a hard week, and, and you just need to know that there's a God who has more grace for you today than you, than you need for your situation, and you just want prayer this morning, would you just raise your hand so we can pray with you? You're in this room this morning. You just need to know that, that God can provide for you. Awesome. God, we just we pray for those hands.
God, we pray for the situations. God, we, we, we know that you're a God who, who, even in this story, God, you took all day just to spend with people, to look people in the eye and say it's going to be okay. Uh, I'm in control of this situation. So, God, we lift up these situations to you. God, we believe you uh, for, for doing the miraculous. God, we believe that you can pro provide for each of these situations. If you're in this room this morning, though, and you would say, uh, maybe I haven't lived as open-handedly. Or maybe even I haven't lived an outrageous faith. Maybe I've lived a little faithful, but I haven't lived full of outrageous faith. And God's just tugging on your heart to maybe think a little bit more outrageously, to, to better examine your resources and what you have to give. And you just feel like God's calling you to give in a bigger way. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray with you? If you're in here and you just want to want to be more outrageously generous. Awesome. God, I pray, Lord, this morning. God, that, that we would, would follow your example. God, that, that we would live so outrageous. God, that, that we would give everything we have. That we'd give every ounce of energy, every time, every emotion. God, we, we'd give you every, every dollar. We'd give you every vehicle. We'd give you every square foot of our house. That we, we'd give it all to you for your kingdom and your glory. God, that you would you know, give us new imaginative ways of, of how we can use what we have for you. God, that, that you would help us to think uh, new things and, and creative ways to be used for your kingdom and your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.